Let us pray. O oh Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit guide our minds and our hearts as we hear the word as it is written and as it is spoken. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. The gospel lesson for this morning has come from the gospel as recorded by St. John, um, chapter 4, verses 5 through 42. It is the story of the woman at the well. So Jesus came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of land Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to get some food from the village. The Samaritan woman said to them, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw from, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, and also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I won't be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me. A time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah, called the Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman, 
but no one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? Then leaving her jar, the water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it is still four months unto harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields. They are ripe unto the harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage, and the one who harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows, Another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labors. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him, to stay with them, and he stayed with them two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. So ends the reading of the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come and see. This passage of the scripture is filled with deep thoughts and challenging concepts. We need to remember the setting in which John wrote this to the church. The early Christian church at this time was struggling, was struggling with the concept, should we include Gentiles into the Christian church? Or did the Messiah only come for the Jews? That was one of the great discussions in the early church when this gospel was written. The setting is at a well in the city of Sychar. Now, the Samaritans named this city Sychar, but in the biblical perspective and in the Jewish perspective, this city was Shechem, where Jacob had built a well that was 125 feet deep. And the well was not just a well where water came into. The well was, a, was an underground river. So people called it the well of the living water. Now keep that thought for later in the message. Yes, first of all, let's look at the characters in this story. And I think this story would make a phenomenal play on Broadway because it is so well put together and says so many things. We have the various characters like Jesus, somebody who was tired, thirsty, and hungry after walking a journey. It was midday in a very hot climate, probably in the 90 degrees, dusty and dry. This is the this is what Jesus was dealing with. And he was sat down by the well. He was tired. 
And then we have the disciples. They went off on their mission to buy food in the village. And then we have the Samaritan woman coming to draw water. A woman who was isolated and shamed. We have the villagers who are curious yet open-minded. What a wonderful setting this is. And the whole story lifts up a number of concepts, bridging barriers, connecting cultures, a style of worship, eternal life, salvation, doing God's will, responding to the call of the Messiah. Yes, in this day, in the day of Jesus, it was very normal for a rabbi who was a professor in today's world, would have a group of followers and they would move from here to there with their teachings and, and the rabbi would point out different points as they were in different parts of the country. So it was a normal setting in Jesus' day. This is not something that was unusual. And in doing that, as I said, Jesus was tired. Jesus was tired. And what this shows, and this deals with another issue that was the early church was struggling with, Jesus' humanity. There were some in the church at the time who believed that anything that was material was not godly. So Jesus, the Son of God, could not have come into a human body because then he would be not godlike. So what John is, you, you notice the little nuances that John is putting in this passage, that Jesus was hungry and thirsty. He was fully human and fully God. Yes, and along came a woman. Along came a woman who was isolated, a shunned person. And when Jesus asked her for a drink, she was shocked. Because in that day, in that day, first of all, no Jew in Jewish culture at that time, and it's true in the Middle East today as well, no man would speak to a woman in public. You only spoke to a woman within the home setting. Even today, as I have visited Orthodox synagogues, the men sit on one side, the women sit on the other. Yes, the woman was shocked that Jesus would speak to her. Not only because she was a woman, but because she was Samaritan. She was those people. We all know the story of the Good Samaritan, and, and this has some of the same connotations as in the Good Samaritan. Yes, Jesus broke down barriers crossed cultural lines, crossed gender lines, and Jesus opened the door. And before Jesus, we never saw this kind of interweaving of cultures and genders. Yes, well, the Samaritans, they had the Torah. They had the first five books, but they didn't have like Isaiah, Jeremiah. So the Jews always thought, the Jews always thought that the Samaritans didn't really worship correctly. And by the way, David had set up Jerusalem as the capital where the temple was, so that's where they should worship. Now the underlying thing here was that, that once upon a time in history, you had the ten northern tribes and you had the southern tribes. There was always a disparity between them. There was always tension. It only broke wide open when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, became king. Yes, 
we in our culture as Christians need to begin to work at breaking down barriers and begin to cross over to bring the gospel to all people. This entire world needs to hear the good news that God loves them, that through Jesus Christ we are set free from sin and guilt. We live in a tribal society. The world is extremely tribal. You have people that have, I've seen people on Facebook that say, I'm not buying Chinese food anymore because they gave us coronavirus. And then we have somebody tweeting from China, it was the American soldiers who brought coronavirus to China. Everybody being tribal, blaming back and forth. That is what Jesus came to transcend and overcome. Yes, when we are tribal, when we say, when we get into that we, they thinking, it will tear apart a community, a culture, a country, and the world. In the midst of this, in the midst of Jesus transcending barriers, Jesus offered to the woman living water. Living water. And what the woman first heard, because everybody said that that well was, had living water, the woman heard Jesus say he was going to get her some water from the well. And so the woman says, how are you going to get me water? You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get water without a bucket? Yes, the offer that Jesus offered the woman was totally misunderstood. Totally missed the point. That statement really raised questions in the woman's mind. And she says, are you greater than Jacob? You see, they called him Jacob. You notice they didn't say Israel. They said Jacob. Are you greater than Jacob, who, who built this well, who watered his flocks, who watered his family from this well? Are you greater than Jacob? You notice the difference? Because is the southern kingdom would have more said, are you greater than Moses? So here's the difference, again, between how the Samaritans looked at things and how Jewish looked at, people looked at things. This, again, shows the divide. What was this living water that Jesus was offering to the woman? What Jesus did next is he opened the book on her life. And he did it so wonderfully. You know, so many times people say things to us when they may disagree with us or something, and they say it in a very accusatory way. But Jesus just said, oh, go get your husband, and I'll explain living water to you once you bring your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus really shocked her. Then Jesus really shocked her. Yes, Jesus says, I know you. You've had five. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. You see, in that day, so many people condemn this woman. But in that day, only a man could divorce a woman. A woman could not divorce a man. This woman had been abandoned either through death or divorce, five times. Can you imagine being abandoned five times? And a woman couldn't go out and get a job. So this woman had attached herself to another man so that she could survive. Some people have tried to point out that she was immoral and all of that. The Bible says nothing about that. And we have to look at it from the point of view of the woman 
who was really struggling. When Jesus said that to her, when Jesus said that to her, the woman deflected from her feelings and changed the subject. Now, don't we do the same when we are confronted with struggles in our life? We look in the mirror sometimes at ourselves and we see ourselves and, and the things that have happened in life. And sometimes people get caught up in the fact that when bad things happen, they must have done something wrong. So you can imagine the guilt that this woman was carrying. Why is my life not working out? And don't we ask that same question? And it was so painful that this woman couldn't really deal with that. So she just said to Jesus, wait a minute, Jesus. Let's settle this dispute of where we can worship. Where is the right place to worship? Is it in Jerusalem, where you Jews say we should worship? Or is it in Gerizim, where we worship? Interesting, a major, major divide between the Jews and the Samaritans. And isn't that how humanity is? We get caught up sometimes in the place where we worship. We think that somehow that the place we worship might be holier or better than the place where others worship. It's not where we worship, it's who, whom we worship. That is what is important in our lives. Yes, this was a hot topic in that day, and it becomes a hot topic in so many circles today that people get caught up into where they worship and not what they worship. But notice, too, the woman was deflecting from dealing with the struggles in her life. And that is a normal human reaction. We want to step out of our struggles. We want to be set free. And so instead of dealing with it, many times we just move out of it and move on and that which is there continues to fester, continues to hurt. Because unless it is brought to light, unless something is brought to light and something is dealt with, it's going to stay there. Yes, Jesus, though, did not take the bait. He did not take the bait of getting into this argument. And so many times we as Christians easily get caught up into that type of bait of, of what is right, what is wrong. And everybody's, you get, a, you get 10 people together, you got 10 different, 10 different ideas, do you not? Everybody has their own interpretation of things. So rather than Jesus getting caught up into this debate, he defined worship rather than getting caught up in the weeds. As I said, it is so easy to get caught up into the weeds, to major in minors rather than minor, to minor in majors rather than major. We, we minor in majors many times, instead of majoring in the major things. Jesus said, Jesus said, one must worship God in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, Jesus God is not controlled by a place. No one has control over where God is. God transcends the world, the universe. God definitely transcends our small universe in which we live. God cannot be controlled. 
No one, no one has a corner on who God is because God continues to unveil himself to people generation after generation after generation. So when Jesus brought out this, the woman couldn't quite deal with it. What is truth? What is spirit? She couldn't handle it. So again, what does she do? She deflects away when, from Jesus. And she begins to say, well, I know the Messiah is going to come and uh, then we'll know everything. Then, then we'll have all the answers when the Messiah comes. Jesus simply says, I am he. Can you imagine sitting there? Because the people in that day were looking so forward to a Messiah coming. And the reason they were really looking for a Messiah is that the tyranny of Rome was so vicious, so cruel, that their vision was that this Messiah would rise up and set them free from Rome. And, and again, the Jewish people thought when the Messiah came, Jerusalem would be capital of the world. Yes, again, Jesus transcended the situation. He didn't get caught up into who the Messiah was going to be, how the Messiah, he just simply said, I am he. Well, at that point, at that point, the woman is totally overwhelmed. She rushes back to the village and she begins to shout to everybody. She begins to shout to everybody. She begins to shout to everybody. The Messiah has come. This man told me everything that happened in my life. Well, all we know is that Jesus told her she had she had had five husbands and she was living with a man she wasn't married to. But the woman was so enthusiastic that she shouted to the village. At the same time, the disciples had come back just before the woman left and they saw Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman and they were totally shocked. How could Jesus do this? Talk to a woman, much less a Samaritan woman. What kind of rabbi do we have? Can you imagine Jesus' disciples at that point? And many times, our cultural beliefs blind us to seeing the gospel at work in our world. Sometimes, our cultural beliefs, our setting, our way of looking at the, the everything blinds us from the opportunities to present the living water, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, delivering eternal life, as I talked about last Sunday, when Jesus said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life, and that God says, I have not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus Christ might be saved. That is the key. That is the kernel of truth that we as Christians have, is that God has sent Jesus into this world, not to condemn, but to lift up God's way of living, which brings shalom, which brings peace, which brings harmony, between us and God and us and each other. Yes, the challenge for us is to move beyond our myopic vision of life. Because of so many challenges, because in our culture we have become so single-focused, and part of that is because there's just so much out there that in order to really know something, we have to be myopic. But at the same time, that can impinge our ability to evangelize the world, 
to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Well, the disciples at the same time came to Jesus, and they too, they too learned a lesson here. Because when they came, they said to Jesus, you need something to eat, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, no, I have food. They said, what? Somebody else bring them something to eat? Wouldn't that be our response? But Jesus said, I have food. I have food for the soul. What Jesus is saying to his disciples, he was trying to teach them a lesson. He taught them to overcome cultural barriers, but he also taught them that they needed to have their spirit and their soul fed as well as their body. Jesus' living water and food for the soul is what feeds us in the deepest parts of our entire being. It lifts us up. It gives us purpose for life. It gives us meaning for life. Yes, Jesus was offering that eternal food, that living water. Yes, when the woman came to the village, the people saw how excited she was. She became a walking spirit of living water in her community. She had moved from where nobody would pay attention to her, or you can imagine the, 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 the talk, 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 talk. She came to the well in the, in the noontime, making very sure nobody else would come there. Most women would either come in the morning or in the evening. But she came at noon, so nobody would talk about her. And all of a sudden, she had something of value to bring to her community. She had found the Messiah. For this was more than a prophet. He was the Messiah, the Christ, the one who'd come to save the world. Yes, the people's eyes were open from seeing how she lived. And many times I say, the only sermon we ever preach is how we live. People watch our actions rather than listening to our words. And this woman experienced through her actions, through her enthusiasm, through her excitement, the ever living water of God. And the people came, they ran to Jesus, and then they, they, they begged Jesus. They heard what Jesus said, and they begged Jesus to stay for two more days. And we, too, need to reach out and ask Jesus to stay with us at all times. Yes, brothers and sisters, questions are, how can we worship in spirit? Now, worship is is called our work of God's life. The way we live as God's people. That's what worship is. We go to worship services to be renewed so that we can go out into the world and perform our worship. Do we worship in the world as the spirit of God within us? And this is a question that goes with us every day. And I'm going to finish up with saying this question, because this is a question I think our culture, our society, our world needs to deal with. Can we transcend bias and culture and unveil the living water, the food of our soul? Can we transcend our culture to move to that level of life in the world. Because it is only then that we will find peace in our heart. It is only then that we will be one in Christ. That we will be able to lift each other up. 
because that is our calling, to bring the gospel, the good news, that Jesus Christ is Lord to this world. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you this day, and we just praise you for always being with us, for promising to always hear our cry, to lift us out of our guilt and out of our shame, to bring us into newness of life as you brought this woman from guilt and shame into newness of life, so that we too can go out into the world and enthusiastically share the loving witness of our Lord. Help us now to move this day and this week in your pathway, and may we be guided and lifted up by your glorious hand at all times. Amen.